All right, welcome class to chapter 13, how to read a 12 lead EKG review. Basically in this chapter, you wanna remember how to do the six steps to a 12 lead EKG interpretation. It always starts out with the first five, which you learned in chapter six, where you have to um, figure out heart rate regulation, uh, QRS interval, PR interval. Um, but with a 12 lead EKG reading, you also not only have to figure out those basic forms, but you have to figure out also um, axis deviation. And the main thing you want to remember when figuring out axis deviation is you want to look at two different leads, which are perpendicular from each other. You want to look at lead one and lead AVF. If for some reason lead one is positive and AVF is also positive, we consider that a normal axis, meaning it's normal. There's nothing abnormal about it. If for some reason lead one is positive and AVF is negative, meaning your QRS is in the negative, it's upside down or in the negative deflection, we call that a left axis deviation. If your lead one QRS is in the negative deflection and your AVF is in the positive deflection, we call that a right axis deviation. And if for some weird reason, both lead one and AVF are both in the negative deflection, we call that an indeterminate axis deviation because we can't determine where the deflection is or where the problem is lying. Now, when you're solving for bundle branch blocks and hemi, hemi blocks, the main two leads you want to look at is V1 and V6. V1 lies on the right side, whereas V6 lies on the left side. The main thing you want to remember is when you're interpreting for hemi blocks and bundle branch blocks is you want to utilize the algorithm that is found on page 287. This algorithm will save you a lot of steps because it kind of walks you step by step by step. Now as far as to figure out hypertrophies, remember in my lecture which was the second lecture to chapter 13 you have to count your r wave how tall your r wave is or how tall your s wave is or how deep your s wave is and add them together and if it's more than 35 millimeters together then you have a left ventricular hypertrophy and with a right hypertrophy uh, which is very rare you'll have a very tall r wave in v1 and you would have a very um, tall S wave in V6, I believe. I have to go back through my notes. I, I don't have my notes with me right quick. But if you go back and listen to that second chapter, it goes through how to find a hypertrophy, the shortcut. <clears throat> also keep in mind that sometimes um, certain things or certain, certain electrolyte abnormalities can make it look like you have um, a heart problem or make it more than what it seems to say that you might have a um, MI that has happened, but you just have an electrolyte imbalance. So it does certain things to your EKG. Remember, when there's, when you're on digitalis, what happens to your T wave? The same thing if you are hyperkalemia, you have those very tall pointy P waves, T waves, I'm sorry, T waves. If you're hypokalemic, it kind of flattens out and sometimes you will actually see a U wave appear because your T wave kind of just almost disappears. It flattens out. Um, when you are hyperkalemia, you have those wide T waves. They're very wide. And when you are hypokalemia, you kind of have a flat 
line T wave. So there's just certain things you need to remember as far as electrolyte abnormalities. And that's pretty much all you can review. Like I said, if you want to go back and get a little more detail, you can re-listen to Chapter 13, Lecture Part 1 and 2, and it will break it down even further for you. Like I said, this is just a quick review of what you need to actually study for the test. If you don't have any questions or anything, good luck in your test, and I will bid you adieu. Bye.